to you that we may see things through your perspective, through your eyes. We pray that we would be filled with uh, Jesus and that we would just be focused on you, O oh Jesus, and just meditate on how beautiful you are and the amazing work you've done for us and your love for us that you demonstrated on the cross. And we pray that for a filling of the Holy Spirit, a working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to shape us, to mold us, to, to um, enlighten us, to, to remind us, to just take control and speak to our hearts. And if our hearts have become calloused or become hard uh, or have become hearts of stone, that you, O Holy Spirit, would come and soften our hearts, that you'd give us hearts of flesh that you may write in our hearts what you desire of us and what you want of us. We pray that, that the word would be effective and, and that any human aspect and power would be hidden and, uh, and that there would be an anointing by the Holy Spirit. We pray for fruit for the words in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we studied uh, Colossians 1, verse 24. So tonight we will start with verse 25. So it says, of which I became a minister. Now, you, are you guys all on board now? Everyone understands? What a way to start a sentence. Of which I became a minister. What's he talking about? Is anyone lost with me? Are you lost? Raise your hand. Be brave. All right. Good. So now put your hands down and read. <laughs> what is of which? What is he talking about? Come on. Help me out. Huh? Of what? Good, good question. That's my question. Of what? Yes. Of which? Of what? Or what is of? Of, of what? Help me out. Colossians 1.25. Of which? Or else the message does not make any sense. Any ideas? Why did he become a minister? Yeah. But what is he a minister of? Of which I became a minister? The gospel. Okay. Who agrees with Susan? She wants people to agree. <laughs> Okay, Nicole agrees by force. Okay, anyone else agrees without uh, feeling, feeling the pressure, Susan's pressure? Okay, you guys agree? Okay, so uh, let's read verse 24. Apparently we forgot it. From We spent two weeks on it. But let's read it real quickly. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. So here we find that Paul, you know, in a not in an ill way or a mental way, but in a really spiritual way, he actually rejoices in, in his sufferings because he suffers for a purpose, for, for people, for you, and, uh, and that's for the Gentiles, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ. And here this is not the atoning suffering of Christ, but Christ left some sufferings behind that is, uh, for us, this is such a, a, a privilege that we have in Christ, that when we suffer, that's part of his sufferings. That's huge. It's amazing. But the second thing is, oh, you're also suffering with us. And that is just shows how amazing Christ is. He's not just sitting up there in heaven and hanging out. He actually suffers when we suffer. Uh, so that's why Paul rejoices, because he's suffering for Christ and for people. But then he's suffering for a, a specific thing, and that is for the sake of his body, and he defines his body, which is the church. So he suffers for his body, and he suffers for his church. The reason he rejoices, because he suffers for the specifically you, which is the people of Colossae. Then uh, two is for Christ, and three is for the church as a whole, the body as a whole. So then after that, he says, of which I became a minister. So what's he a minister of? That church, thank you. Now let me read verse 23. We're going to back up a little bit. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. What's he a minister of? In that verse. The gospel. Thank you. So this one is the gospel. This one is the church. Is it the same thing or different? Different. 
So what is this telling us? In, in one chapter, two verses, in three verses, he talks about of which I'm a minister, but he's a minister of two different things. And one is the gospel, one is the church. But first he talks about the gospel, then he talks about the church. What is this talking about? It's something very important that we all need to get. And I, I, I feel that there's a lot of times um, focus only on one, and depending on what church you go to or what person in the church that you talk to, there's one main focus on one. But God wants us to have focus on both. And that's really important. And that's focus on the gospel. And focus on the church. Focus on the gospel is talking about talking to unbelievers. To try to share the gospel with people who don't know Christ. Have a, have a heart, the heart of Christ that made him die on the cross because he, we, while we were sinners, he came and died on the cross. That we would want people not to go to hell and out of love that we would go share with them the word of God. The gospel means the good news that, hey, you don't have to go to hell. God made a way, and you don't have to do works because you're going to fail. But God did it by grace, you're saved, and that's uh, through faith. And so that's the message of the gospel. And I really hope that every one of us has this ingrained in us, whether if you are gifted in being an evangelist or whether you're not, we're all evangelists. Whether we like it or not, God expects us and wants us to be an evangelist to people around us. Some have the gift of evangelism and some have the gift of being missionaries. That's their gift. And they're no more special than anybody else as long as we use the gift that God has given us. But do you and I have a heart for people who don't know Christ? Or is it like, not my gift, I'm on the other end? No, I have to have a heart for everybody and want to share with them about Christ in whether that's through language or whether that's through life. And preferably, and the most important is actually through both. That I'm not just talking yaggedy yak and my life has nothing to do with Christ, but I need to be living. And then that needs to, that should bring up questions from people around me that I should start sharing with them the gospel. And so this verse 23, but verse 25 says, but there's also something very important, and that is the church. I need to also minister to the church. We, we are not to be like, boom, boom, we got one more for Christ, yay, no. That's not, you need, people need growth. People need to grow up. People need to not just be babies forever in Christ, and they need to be plugged in to a church. They need to be plugged in in a body, in a place, a Bible study, somewhere where they have accountability, where they have someone that cares for them and tries to teach them the Word of God and, and where they grow, where they get the teachings of the Word of God. And so that's what Paul is saying here, of which I became a minister. And I pray that, you know, if, if you've ever shared the gospel with someone and that person came to Christ whether you prayed for them or after many times they just on their own, but through what God used you in their lives, don't just stop there. Plug them in. And please don't feel like you have to plug them into your church. Plug them into a safe church that teaches the word of God and where you think they will grow. All of us will grow better in different places. And so just plug them in to don't be stuck to a place. Be stuck to Jesus, okay? Let people hear Jesus Christ. Don't put them in a church where they don't teach Jesus, but put them in a church where they teach Jesus, and they teach Jesus right, and they don't water anything down. And so here he says, Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship. According to the stewardship from God. And a stewardship means that uh, uh, a steward is someone who is like Joseph. Joseph in the Old Testament, he was a slave. How much does a slave own? Nothing. And, but a steward is someone who's in charge of something that they don't own, but they have to give an account of it. So Joseph was a good steward or a bad steward? Good steward. And that's why his, his master, the Potiphar, when he saw him, he's like, man, something there's something, something about this guy. Well, he didn't say that, but he said, man, there's something really special about this guy. Something is weird. He touches something, it gets blessed. And I am a smart businessman, so let me to have him touch a little more things. So a few more things he touches, and I'm like, I think I'm right. 
This guy keeps everything he touches, keeps blessing. He's like, you know what? Let me have him touch a little few more things. Then he had him do that. He's like, wow, this is amazing. Then he says, you know what? Let me make sure this guy touches everything I got. And I don't even have to worry about it. I'm just going to go party all the time. And he did. He didn't keep nothing. And everything kept getting blessed because of Joseph, because he was a good steward. Now, what's the requirement of a steward? There's only one requirement in the word of God. Does anyone know it? All right. Well, since you're all going to rush at it, let's open up 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Moreover, it is required in stewards. Oh, wait, that's what we're talking about. All right, good. Let's pay attention. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So it's a prerequisite. You don't have this requirement. You don't go to that class. You don't become this person. So to be faithful in what you do. So here Paul is in Colossians 1 verse 25 says, Of which I became a minister. So you became a minister of the church. So his, now his ministry, so his ministry, he has two ministries. One ministry is he shares the gospel with people. He wins people for Christ. He shares with people who don't know Christ. He, he talks to the lost. But the second ministry he has, which is, that was verse 23, about talking to the lost. But the, the ministry of to the church, which is verse 25, he says, I also build up people. I also uh, uh, help edify people. I also get people to grow in Christ. I work in the church of which I became a minister. Well, what? Gave, who gave you this? He says, I didn't appoint myself according to the stewardship from God. Meaning, I am not an owner. I don't own a church. I don't own the church. But God, in his grace, found me, Paul, to be a steward. He says, you don't own anything, but you're in charge of this. And remember, it is required of a steward to be what? Faithful. Wow, all right, good. We still remember it from two minutes ago. Faithful. To be faithful. So he says, so I have the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, you Colossians. To fulfill the word of God. And here to fulfill the word of God means that it is my job as a steward, is I need to give a good account of this to God. And so I need to fulfill the word of God because I did not appoint myself for this, but he appointed me. So I want to do it. I want to fulfill the will of God. I want to share the word of God as is. I want to share it without, you know, watering it down, without giving it, you know, adding salt and pepper to it. I want to give it as is. Because it is good. The word of God is good. And I want to share that. And the word of God, if we don't mess with it, people grow. People grow and they get to, to, to mature in Christ. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And I really think that anyone, you know, we all have some kind of a ministry. If we are Christians, we should at least doesn't have to be some office or some recognized thing. It could be something that no one else knows about but you. And that ministry, if we look at it the way Paul looks at the ministry that he has, it's going to be impossible to lose heart. It's going to be impossible to just give up. It's going to be impossible to say, oh, no, that's it. This is not working out. Why? Because if I look at it is, I don't own it. So then the frustration is gone of it. But I need to be faithful, not to the ministry, but faithful to him. I'm a steward of him, of this thing that he has given me. So then it becomes a very powerful thing if I realize that this is from God. So if someone, say sometimes preachers, they will go and they'll preach, and then the crowd that comes in starts to be less. They get really frustrated, and well, that's concerning. Concerning because they might not be looking at it as a steward. They might be looking at it as, this is my ministry. 
not his ministry. According to the ministry that I became a minister, that he, be, he made me a minister, of which I became a minister according to what I like, according to what my gift is. No, according to the stewardship from God. And so if someone is frustrated in whatever ministry that they're in, there's an important thing to do is to pause, stand, and ask the Lord, did I, did you get me here? Or did I get myself here? And if I'm the one that got myself here, then maybe I need to revisit and ask him, do you still want me here in this ministry? Or do I need to uh, not be doing this because I'm messing with something that you did not appoint me over and you did not put me in it? Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And then we find that when we look at it as a stewardship, we find this energy that keeps coming in. The energy that makes me feel like, wow, man, I, 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 I'm not in charge, but, you know, I want to fulfill the word of God. I don't want to do part of it. I want to fulfill it. I want to do it as is, just like he wanted me to do it. I want to make him proud. I want to just excite God. I want to make God really pleased with the way it's done, that it's done right about him for his glory. Then he goes into verse 26, the mystery. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So a mystery, you know, nowadays we think of it as like, ooh, spooky. <laughs> That's not what it is at all. Mystery in the word of God, it talks about a secret. It's a spiritual secret. It's something uh, so holy, so amazing, that any human, no matter how clever they are and how smart they are, and, you know, they try all their best to think and do, you know, whatever, and be creative. They could never figure it out. It could only be figured out through the Holy Spirit causing an enlightenment within that we can understand it. And he, the, the Holy Spirit enlightened many people about this mystery. But specifically, the most important that was enlightened about this is Paul. And uh, many others, you know, they know it and they know this mystery, not just Paul. But some resisted it. For example, Peter resisted this mystery. So let's say, what is this mystery that he's talking about? So the mystery that he's talking about, basically, very simply, it's something that, um, again, was not known till the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, this did not exist. It was not known in the Old Testament. And that is that the church, the church is a new concept. The church was born in the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was given, that's when the church was born. So uh, it is my personal belief, but it's just a sim my simple belief, some might disagree, that it is very difficult to uh, speak about something in the Old Testament and say that's the church, because it didn't exist. The church existed in the New Testament in, Col in Acts chapter 2. It's okay to take symbolic lessons and things like that, um, and uh, uh, so, but I like to look at it as a relationship of believers with uh, God when I, when I learn things from the Old Testament rather than generalizing it to the church because the church was born. In, but that's semantics, not a big deal. Uh, but just, you know, here he's talking about a mystery, and this mystery was what was hidden from ages. So it's talking about, ooh, a long time ago. It's hidden. No one could figure it out. Oh, and from generation... Uh, and from generations, lots of generations passed, nothing until that time. But now, at that time, voila, it has been revealed to his saints. And only the people who can get this are the believers. So what is it? The church. What is the church? The church is that Gentiles and Jews are one who believe in Christ, who are saved, are one in the church and the body of Christ. It's huge. It's an amazing mystery that would have never thought of. Now, the mystery is not that an, an, a Gentile is saved. Because is that something not known in the Old Testament? Can anyone name any Gentiles that were saved in the Old Testament? Any Gentiles? So, Job, thank you. Job is one Gentile. But there's lots of Gentiles that became saved. And so it's not a new mystery that Gentiles are saved. But it's a new mystery that Gentiles 
and Jews are equal in Christ. And they, they share the glory and they are part of one body. And that's the new mystery. And so here he says, I became a ministry to the church, and this is such a huge mystery. It's an amazing thing which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known, so the saints, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this Mystery among the Gentiles. And here he's focusing on the Gentiles. Why? Because, you know, I mean, it's really a huge thing to ever think of. I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but... Well, let's, let's talk about the specific thing he's talking about in the mystery. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where's Christ? In us. Wow. Is that like a big deal? Okay? Forget everybody else, okay? I know you are like the biggest saint on the planet. Like, we're all saints if we're believers, but I know you're like, you know, you think you're the best in the West, you know? So, but if you really look in the mirror, like honestly, okay, in front of God, and um, just think about it. Look at yourself. Think of your life. And look, hmm, Christ. You know who's Christ, right? He's God, okay? Is living. In me. Yeah, you, if you're a believer. I mean, is that like huge or like, I deserve it. I mean, like, have you seen the way I look? So nice. I'm so pretty. (laughs) I'm so handsome. (laughs) I mean, where else would he live? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) right? Who really would? I mean, okay, fine. Go to Hebrews. Chapter 12, the last verse, it says, Our God is a consuming fire. You know what consuming fire means? Like, whoosh, it's gone. Whatever it is, it doesn't exist anymore. And, oh, Jesus Christ is God. And um, he's dwelling, if you're a believer in me. Is that huge or not? It's huge. It's really, really huge. Now, to think of, the Jews have this little thing on their head, you know, they think they're so uh, special that, you know, like, okay, you know, I mean, it's really a big deal, but, you know, God dwelling in me, you know, I am a Jew after all. Okay, they have a the little thing like that. I told you guys one time I was, you know, standing and uh, getting, trying to get an elevator and this guy, a Jewish guy, who's a Messianic Jew, meaning he's a believer, a Christian, he's, so he's part of the church. So press the elevator, the door opened, and <laughs> and uh, some of you have heard this before. So anyway, so I was like, please go ahead. And he says, no, please go ahead. I said, no, no, I insist. He says, no, I insist. And he says, well, okay, fine. I'll go Jew first, then Gentile, like in Romans. And I was like, oh, I got to sock you, man. <laughs> it was up with that. It's just messed up. It made me mad. I wanted to tell him, come out and let me go first. I'm just kidding now. <laughs> But I was like, touche, that's a good one. So, um, but can you imagine a Gentile, a Gentile, that's us, okay? No one here is a Jew. No one here is that special. But a Gentile, Christ, God, dwelling in me. You know, we missed this because... We were not like the people of Colossae who had nothing. We grew up in Christian families. We've heard about Christ. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it's not huge to us because we don't understand the amazing thing of it. But Paul understands. And that's why he says here, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles. So the mystery, is it huge or not? Huge or not? Yes. Are you convinced or not? Christ is living in you. That's amazing, okay? Oh, so here he doesn't say it's just a mystery. Oh, he says, no, no. The glory of this mystery. Meaning Christians start getting excited about Christ living in you. This is a huge thing. 
Oh, wait, hold on. He doesn't stop there. He says, the riches of the glory of this mystery. Do you know how rich and glorious this amazing thing that you have is? And yet, we live as poor and miserable, down Christians. When God has, has exalted us, God dwells in us, God has given us this amazing, glorious, yet rich mystery that Christ dwells in us. What's he trying to say? He's trying to say, get back to your first love. Remember that you were dead, you were once dead, and now he made alive to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory it to me I picture this like the um, uh, uh, the burning bush when Moses went Moses went and he's like oh that's kind of cool wait a minute that's weird it's this is a bush there's fire but it's not burning. That's exact. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that God can dwell in us and live in us. Yet we're like, ah, yeah, I'm Christian. I don't want to tell nobody because it's like, you know. are you kidding me? You should be like, ha, ah! ha, You can't, you shouldn't be able to control yourself from how amazing it is to be a Christian. How amazing it is to have Christ within, to have this riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Christ is in me. Do you want Christ? You need him. You need him to be saved. Remember the mystery, the, the, the ministry of the gospel, but also the ministry of the church. And here he says, which is the hope of glory? Meaning the hope, the hope is about the hope of glory. Glory is heaven. We have the hope of glory. Why do we have the hope of glory? Because Christ dwells in us. Meaning it's as good as guaranteed. Christ dwells in you. It's as good as you in heaven already. So if you're still in those stages, you're like, am I going to go to heaven or not? And you gave your life to Christ. You confessed your sin. I'm talking about true believers, not some emotional thing or an altar experience. Not every altar experience is a true salvation. But I'm talking about true salvation. And you're like, oh, am I going to go to heaven? Are you kidding me? The hope of glory dwells in you. Where else are you going to go? You're going to go to heaven. I'll get past that and I'll start living for him. And start being excited about God and start living like a rich person. A rich person that lives in glory, he'll walk in style. You know, have you ever seen people that, uh, you know, they're very rich? What do you see them driving? You know, they drive some really nice cars. And they go, and when they tip, they're the type of people you want them to tip you. You're like, can I be the waiter? But you don't work here. I know, but their tip is nice. It's more than the bill. You know, I want to work for them. And so, um, you know, I, I, can you imagine, you know, if I uh, went up to Oprah, I'd be like, hey, can you give me a tip? It's like, Whew. I can't imagine what her tip would be, you know. And so, but um, rich people walk like they're rich, like they're large, and they just live according to their status because it's embarrassing, you know. When I roll up in my work and stuff into our work parties, my poor wife, you know, she's like, oh, we can't be rolling like this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She doesn't say that. But, <laughs> but, you know, people at my job, like, why are you driving this thing? You know, this is not what I said. Leave me alone. It's my style. I'm setting a new style. <laughs> so... Um, But I tell you guys, as Christians, we don't walk in style as we should as Christians. I'm telling you, we are not to claim and sing songs about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. No, we are to live a life of, we are not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed, I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to be wishy-washy about because I have the riches of the glory of the mystery Christ himself. Even though I'm unworthy, he lives in me. And that's why I can come to you 
and speak to you about his love for you. That's why I don't care if you ridicule me because I'm rich. I don't care what you have to say about me. You know, the, if the celebrities or whatever they are, if they care about what people say about them, you know, they would all have a, they would be a mess. Or politicians, people say all kind of, whenever you're in any position of spotlight, people will, whoo, will do that kind of stuff. But you know how to be like, listen, <laughs> these people are jealous. They don't have what I got, you know. They don't drive what I drive. They don't, that's what they think, you know. But the thing is, we're not to be ashamed. We're not to be upset. We're not to be, because we have Christ in us. And if we have him in us and his good pleasure, that he's pleased with us, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what people think of us. It doesn't matter what people call us. But what matters is that we live that rich life, the life of the riches, of the glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach. And I love this because if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul also writes, and he says, For we do not preach ourselves. What do you preach? But Christ Jesus, the Lord. And ourselves, here's what we are. You're bond servants for Jesus' sake. We're here to serve you for his sake. But when I talk, when I preach, Paul says, I'm going to share with you a person. I'm going to share with you about Jesus Christ. I'm not here to tell you about me and my stories and how cool I am or whatever. It's not, it doesn't matter. But I preach to you Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1 verse 28 says, Him we preach. I'm not here to preach politics. I'm not here to preach what's the latest news about whatever. I'm not here to preach about me. I'm not here to make you a follower of me. I'm here to tell you about a person. I'm here to tell you about Jesus. And that's what preaching should be about. It should be about a person. It should be about Jesus. We shouldn't get so caught up in whatever is happening. Yes, there's messy things in the world and whatever. He's in control. God, you reign. We sang it. He reigns. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. He's in control. But preach him. Focus on him. Because when we focus on these little things, we're automatically not focusing on him. We start to fall and fail and get preoccupied. But if we focus on him and we preach him as we pray, he may lead us to pray appropriately for these things that are happening for people for nations, for whatever he leads us as he sees fit. Him we preach. And preach here in the, gospel, in, the, in the Greek means that we are proclaiming the word with authority. Meaning, I'm preaching Jesus with authority. I'm here to tell you about someone that's a big deal. About the best person ever. I'm here to talk to you about someone very special. I'm here to share with you about Jesus. And here we see Paul is doing three things in this verse. First is he's preaching. And he's not the only one preaching. He says, him we preach. There's a bunch of us that preach. And I hope you start sharing Jesus with people. Don't start sharing you with people. Don't start sharing anything. You know, philosophies or whatever, or politics, share Jesus. Him we preach. Second thing is warning every man. So is he warning believers or unbelievers? Huh? Didn't hear. Both. You're right. Or else it wouldn't be every man. Warning every man. And that's something we don't like to do. Oh, no. I need to be politically correct. I can't warn anybody. What if they get mad at me? What if they? 
warning every man. If you open up Acts 20, verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that for three years, he was talking to people of Ephesus, the elders of Ephesus, the pastors of Ephesus. Therefore watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease, I mean I didn't stop, to warn every one. Wow, every man. Oh, for how often? Didn't stop, so that cease. Oh, he says, oh, there isn't a time at the day that I didn't do it. Night and day with tears. I did it from my heart. I did it with tears. And I did it late at night. I did it early in the morning. I was 24-7. And I was every single person. Warning everyone with tears. That I warning did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you. I'm not here to be like, ah, I caught you, sucker. You know, I'm not like that. I'm not here to shame you. Say, oh, shame on you. You're a terrible person. Aha, uh -huh, caught you in the act. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now I try to, I got this to blackmail you, all right? You know, not like that. But as my beloved children, I love you. I'm not here. This is just between you and me. It's not going to go outside. I warn you. As beloved children, I warn you, unfortunately, we do things to shame people. Back to Colossians 1.28. Him we preach. I don't just speak with authority about a person, about Jesus, but I also warn. And I warn every man. But I don't just warn. I also teach every man. Teaching, you know, imagine. So here's what warning looks like. Let's pretend I'm the one warning. And then I see you, you know, like doing something like, ah, ah, dangerous. Okay. You go to the next thing. Oh, don't do that. Okay. Third thing you're trying to, you're like, ah, brother, I, I fear this could put you in, you know, in trouble. Okay. Next thing is like, ah, not this one either. After a while, you're like, okay. But then that's why it can't stop at that. It says teaching every man. So we don't just warn of the negatives, of the possible bad impacts, but we also teach the word of God. We also teach the positives. We also teach the truths of the word of God. What do we have in Christ? What's our position in Christ? How awesome is Christ? And also, how do we act? How do we live? Not only what should we not do, well, okay, what do I do then? That's teaching. That he teaches us what to do, teaching. So teaching includes what do I do? How do I guide my life? What are the truths? What's the knowledge, biblical knowledge of what is it? Where am I? What's my position and what's my practice? I need to know both. If I don't know my position... I will have no, I won't be able to practice well. But if I only know how to practice and I don't have the, I need both. I need to be able to do both. And so here he says, him we preach, warning every man. And this is sinners and Christians. We all, there's none of us that don't need any warning, okay? There's none of us perfect that don't mess up and don't make any mistakes. Warning every man and teaching every man. There's none of us that don't need to learn more about the word of God. They're to learn more about Christ. Remember, we're preaching him him we preach, remember, that's why Paul says to know him. He's not done learning. To know him. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Very important. Not in occasional wisdom or in wisdom. No, in all wisdom. Because we can warn people, but not wise at all. And we cause a disaster. We can teach people not wise at all. And we can cause a disaster. So please, if you or I feel like, hmm, I need to warn brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, before you do the warning, put it through the check. Before you do anything, just while you're alone, just practice it. And say, okay, let me pass it through the wisdom uh, chamber. And if there's wisdom, go for it. If there isn't, but also, you know, make sure there's love. 
But if there isn't, just keep it to yourself, all right? Someone else will warn this person. But what we need to do is we need to do it in all wisdom. You know, I love this verse in um, Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken. It's like, bam. It's just right on. Not just a word spoken, but it's fit, perfect, right where it should be. A word fitly spoken is like, here's what it looks like. Apples of gold. Wow, that sounds expensive. Oh, yeah. In settings of silver. So it's not an apple of gold in a setting of silver, no. Apples of gold in settings of silver. So how many apples are there? A lot. And how many container setting? Lots of containers. Meaning you're really rich. Just one word. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Ooh, you're like a king and a queen. Is it easy to do that? Anyone here really good with words and so wise? Please raise your hand if you think you're wise. No takers on this one. All right. He, James chapter 3, verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. Let me read it again. For you all stumble in many things. Did I read correctly? No, what did I say wrong? What's wrong with what I said? I'm reading the word of God here. We, oh, what did I say? You. What's the difference between you and we? We, I include myself. Who's writing this? Not Paul. Not everything is written by Paul, okay? James. <laughs> yes, he wrote more than half of the New Testament, but not everything is by Paul. So, <laughs> James. Does anyone know who James is? Like, what's his, like, relationship to Jesus Christ? Didn't it? He's the brother of Jesus. You want to call him the half-brother, the brother? This is a negotiation for a later debate, not for right now. But he is, for simplicity, we'll call him the brother of Jesus because that's what you could read it like that in the Bible. Now, do you think he's, like, an okay guy or not an okay guy? The brother of Jesus, does he, like, know what's up? I mean, he... The Holy Spirit used him to write us a whole letter. That's a big deal. The guy's a big deal, okay? If you read Acts chapter 10, there's a, a, a 15, sorry, there's a big debate that happened. And guess who really gave the final ruling in Israel about should you be circumcised or not? Do you guys know who did it? James, you guys are cheating because if I didn't say this, you would say Peter. So it looks like Peter, but really the one who was, in, he was even in higher authority at that time was James. But it's not a topic. So James, who wrote the Word of God, part of the Word of God, James, who is the brother of Jesus, James, who settled such a sensitive issue with such firmness that no one was able to speak after he was done, it was a done deal. Not Paul was able to solve it, not Peter was able to solve it. James solved the issue of circumcision. Do you circumcise or not? And that salvation has nothing to do with works or circumcision. He says, not you all stumble, but we, he says, I am, I got problems, just like you have problems. We all stumble in some things. Yeah? Many things, wow. Anyone here is thinking really highly of themselves? Like, yep, mm, that's me. <laughs> Many things is a lot. And... If you don't stumble, you've stumbled right there by saying you don't. We all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he doesn't say plural. Why? Because a word fitly spoken, one word is enough to cause a disaster or cause amazing things. If anyone does not stumble in word, here he's talking about an individual, this is a perfect man. Able also to brittle the whole body. Wow, he says. But again, does that person exist? No. James is struggling with it. I'm telling you, it's hard to speak words. That's why, in, you know, I didn't really want to get into this, but Galatians chapter 6, 
uh, verse 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. So here's someone messed up, okay? Did something wrong. So what do they need? To be warned, right? Of what they've done and to be corrected. And to, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Not everyone to go and not the leaders to go, whoever is spiritual, okay? Doesn't say you have to have a title. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. You're going there not to be like, aha, finally I got something on you. No, I'm here to restore you. I'm here to bring you back to Christ. The purpose is not to, 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 to put your head in the ground. The purpose is to bring your head out of the ground. To restore such a one. And make sure when you do it, don't say, I told you, I warned you a few times. And uh-huh. No, do it in a spirit of gentleness. Be gentle. Why? Considering yourself lest you also be tempted because we all stumble in many things and you are no better. If you think you can't stumble in that thing, you'll probably be the first one to stumble in it. Him we preach, Colossians 1.28, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. That we may present every man Perfect in Christ Jesus. What's the purpose of your preaching, of your warning, of your teaching? He says, I'm not just doing it to do it. There's a purpose, there's a reason, there's an outcome that I'm hoping for. And that is to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The reason I do it is because I love these people. And I want to present these people as a priest, and they are my sacrifice to Christ. In the Old Testament, you were not allowed to bring a sacrifice that's blind or a sacrifice that has an ailment. No, no. You have to bring a perfect animal to present to Christ. And here he says, I'm not, I don't want to just give a bunch of babies to Christ. But I want to bring perfect here means mature, fully mature people to Christ. And this shows that the motive behind of these three things, preaching, warning, and teaching, is a motive of love. And the desire is, I want you to be good. Actually, I want you to be better than anybody. I want you to be the best that you can be. I want you basically to reach the full potential that Christ has for you with your the way you are and how God made you I want you to reach that amazing potential but have you guys noticed there's something repeated three times in this verse every you're right anything else The word after it, man, every man. And here, you know, this says a lot about how we should view things. That him, not I preach, but him we preach. This is something that needs to be done by all of us. We need to speak about Jesus, share Jesus, proclaim Jesus boldly. All of us need to be doing that. But also we need to warn every man. That's not, you know, we need to do it, yes, with, wis with all wisdom. And we need to be teaching every man, yes, with all wisdom. Because, you know, we could do teaching without wisdom, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. You're so messed up. Let me just teach you how. Like... <laughs> where do I start? You know, that's not wisdom. That's like destroying the person. With all wisdom. But the purpose is maturity for every man. But here it talks about every man, talking about an individual, not men, but man. What it says is that there's a huge importance huge importance and I think it's the most important or the most fruitful thing is the one-on-one -on -one ministry 
that we have with one another as believers and also that we have with unbelievers. You know, preachers go share the word and they're done. Boom. Some leave and never talk to anybody. Some will talk, but you can capture one, two, and maybe effective. And that's effective. That's important to every man. And the, the work of preachers is essential and very important in the word of God. Because you can't downplay it because the word of God speaks very highly of it. But each one, each believer needs to be a preacher, not from a pulpit, but needs to have relationship with people. But the relationship's purpose is to present everyone perfect in Christ. So, so that relationship, whatever it is, needs to take on the appropriate measure, the appropriate way, in the appropriate fashion, that nothing should, should, should step into that boundary of, of God, to get in the way of God allowing a perfection of this person in Christ. So that means that you need to be a blessing to every single person you come in contact with, believer or unbeliever, you like, you don't like, because it says every man for all things, with all wisdom. This is, this is huge. This is a, a huge responsibility on every believer, guys. It means we need to get our act together. We need to confess our sins before God and repent and say, Lord, I can't preach Christ unless I'm living like a Christian because here it says proclaim with authority. I can't proclaim Christ with authority if my life has no Christ in it, or at least he's not showing in my life. But I need to proclaim Christ, and which means him we preach. That's what the word means. Okay, I'm gonna, I want to end this chapter, so I'm going to be very fast. To this end, I also labor. Talking about my purpose here, what God has done for me is to, to make me preach, warn, and teach so that everyone would become perfect in Christ. To this end, to try to get this, this effect of people... To this end, I also labor. Here meaning I am just to exhaustion. I'm sweating. I'm putting all this effort into doing this. In my one-on-one -on -one conversation with people, in my relationship with people, striving according. Now here he says labor and striving. And striving is a, is a word from athletics, from uh, the, the Olympic Games. It's talking about someone who's really training, working really, 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 really hard to not just run the race, but to win the race. So here he says, <clears throat> here's what I'm doing about trying to, to be effective in people's lives, to, to have people become perfect in Christ. I labor and I strive. I'm sweating I am and then the the word striving also means agony I'm in agony I'm in I'm just like oh you know that's it there's no more drop of energy as I'm doing this for Christ and then as he's doing this he realizes that wait a minute I should be like in total exhaustion right now and then he realizes something weird is happening to his working oh wait I'm not really doing all of this I just gave myself to him completely and gave him full control of my life his working, which works in me mightily. Suddenly I'm so rejuvenated. Now I'm laboring more and striving more. But that's what we're missing. A lot of times we just kind of like, eh, that's a lost cause. Forget that guy. Forget this lady. <laughs> We don't labor. We don't strive. I tell you something. This is the truth. If anyone is still alive, Christian or non-Christian, God hasn't given up on them yet. When that person dies, they're done. God is done with them. Good or bad, Christian or unchristian. When someone dies, God is done with them. Doesn't mean done with them in a bad way. God is done, was done with Paul, but he had a crown at the time of his death, the crown of righteousness. 
And that he had because he said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I've done all these things the right way. And so he, that, when he went to die, God was done with him on earth. That's it. His time is done. Some people, they die because, as Christians, they die because they've done what God wanted them to do, and they're done. Some Christians die because God is done with them, but not in a good way. They die under God's discipline, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But unbelievers, every single unbeliever, when they die, God is totally done with them. All their chances are done. They're going to hell. So if someone is still alive, and God has put you in their life, God wants us to, if we want to be good stewards, God wants us to labor, to strive. Purpose is to bring maturity in this person that I, or you, the believer, is a blessing to their life. Doing that through preaching, warning, and teaching. Some people say, verse 29, the labor and striving is talking about prayer. The way, because sometimes we just can't talk to anybody. Sometimes people have blocked us out, and maybe we, it's wise not to talk. But do I put effort in prayer, or it's these cold prayers that are like, hmm. I'm not talking about, I want to differentiate because a powerful prayer is not, doesn't mean a prayer full of emotions and tears and crying. That could be an amazing, powerful prayer, but that could also be a just a worthless prayer. Just like a prayer that is spoken in a tone, like someone is speaking, could be a very powerful prayer, could be a worthless prayer. It's not an act, it's not an issue, it's not like, because some people get sometimes so caught up and so affected, oh, look at how they pray and cry, they must be, it doesn't mean they're fervent. And the same thing, the other, oh, look, oh, wow, that's a boring prayer meeting. That doesn't mean they're not fervent. And it's not either or, only God knows the stuff. But I'm talking about, like, is this like, do I really labor? God knows if you and I are laboring. We could be like, oh, Lord, please pray, you know, Iraq and, you know, Syria. And, and I, you know, I saw the blood. And, and I'm really crying because I saw the blood. And I'm traumatized by the blood, but I really don't care about what's happening. That's not prayer in, in whatever. That's you traumatized needing to help. I'm being honest because we, a prayer is so messed up. The Holy Spirit, he is, to us as Christians, we are messed up about our idea of the Holy Spirit. We don't understand him. But prayer also, and what effective prayer is, and answered prayer, oh man, and don't get me. <sighs> answered prayer. We need God to be the one empowering us. If we feel faint, feel like we're losing heart something is wrong not with anyone around us but with us if we're laboring and striving and there's no fruit that means that we need to labor and strive because then when we keep going we get energized because he's the energized because his he's the one working in us and his work in us is not weak but in me mightily god is strong so when we serve, if you look at this verse as prayer, pray right. Labor and strive. Put whatever it is before God and labor and strive. And this does not mean, you know, prayer is not this thing of, okay, I'm going to nag him enough to say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Can I get an iPad? Can I get an iPad? Can I get an iPad? Just get an iPad. No, that's not, it's not to... Twist God's arm to just do our will. That's not right prayer. And you can keep trying. It's not going to work. Because he's God. He reigns. And he knows what's good for you and what's good for me. He just won't. He is going to be like, la, 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 la. It's not going to. But prayer, when it's empowered by him, when we have agony, and when we have, when we sweat, but not weak, not to the point of weak, but continuing to be empowered by God, is a prayer that's in the Holy Spirit because he's the one working in us. 
that is according to the will of God and it will happen. Read John chapter 8 if you want to know how to pray right. And every prayer, boom, answered. John chapter 8 talks about how the disciple should pray. I'm talking about real disciple. Like not every Christian is a disciple. We pray in his will. And powerful. But if we talk about it as serving God and serving God through our relationship with people, I need to, my, not me, you, us, I need as a believer to not give up on people, to just continue to labor and strive and keep doing that with persistence. The method is known, preaching Jesus, warning, and teaching. If I find that all I'm doing is warning, there's a problem there. If I find that all I'm doing is just teaching, you know, well, amen. But, you know, every one of us will need some warning. And uh, I just really pray that God will work in us to just give us that energy back. And that we need to be empowered by him. To be able to preach him. To preach him to others. To have ministry of whatever it is. You know, some people's ministry is that they are... Is there, um, like, for example, we were actually, it's kind of funny, we were talking about some of the stuff in the car with the kids. Um, you know, we are talking with one of our daughters that the parent's job, and that's a responsibility from God, my wife was sharing, that it's to discipline you and to warn you and to do things like that. And, and you know, if we don't do that, we're not doing our job right as parents. And then, um, and we were sharing, you know, that, it's not just warning. There's warning. There's encouragement. There's all kind of, you know, kids do a lot of good things. So we need to encourage and say, yes, good job. And then there's some occasional bad decisions. Um, and uh, I like how my wife, I said sometimes a kid is being bad. And my wife says, no, they make bad decisions. And I like that word. That was the more proper word. And I said, yes, you make bad decisions because you're not bad. And then we have to warn. We have to discipline. And... Um, and really, that's what we need to be doing, not, but not with just the, you know, our children, but wherever your ministry is. Your ministry may be your children. And the Bible admonishes, we were talking about this in the car too, admonishes mothers specifically that they need to raise their, if you read Timothy, that they need to raise their children in the Lord. A mother's ministry may be the children, to raise them up in God's fear, to know God. That both parents, maybe their ministry is the, is the house. Maybe there's more than that. Maybe that's whatever it is. Don't say, oh, I have too little. No, I have too much. No, whatever God has given you is the perfect amount that is for you. You know, I really love and, and I, I learn a lot about when Moses um, came and complained. You know, there's two times that people get confused about. One time when his father-in-law, that's the one that Nazih preached about, his father-in-law said, this job is too much for you. You can't be judging people all day, uh, like being a judge, like a court judge for all the cases from morning till night. He says, you're going to get exhausted. You can't do this. You've got to choose some people to help you out. And that, the, the word of God doesn't say that there's anything wrong with that. So he got helpers to help him judge the people. But there's another time when Moses complained. So this was not, the first one was not Moses' coming up with it. But the second time, Moses was so upset. He complained. He told God, did I give birth to these people? These people drive me crazy. I want to like, oh, you know, like I just don't know what to do with them. They make me so mad. I don't know. I, I just, kill me. Take me. I need help. So here is Moses complaining about the huge ministry. I mean, you know, 600,000 men above age 20. Hmm. So if you calculate the men or less than age 20 to birth and then all the wives and all the kids, the girls, that's at least 3 million people that he's in charge of. And they love to complain. They do nothing but complain. And so, I mean, I sympathize with the guy. But when he said, I can't do it, God said, fine, gather a group of people. He told him who to gather. The people gathered. And he says, okay, now, Moses, you need help? I will take from the spirit that I gave you, and I will give to them. What's God saying is, you complained, you lost heart in the ministry I gave you. Yes, it's huge, 
but I give you the power to do it. And that's why when I need to do this ministry, I'm not going to give them anything extra. I'm just going to take from you and redistribute because you had what was sufficient. You know, help is good, but only when God brings it in his way. When God doesn't bring help in his way, don't lose heart and don't complain because that's his, what he has given. And that's why we have to have this ministry according to the stewardship from God. I'm not doing this on my own. I didn't place myself here, but he placed me, and I better be faithful because I'm a steward. And I'm going to do this because I want to fulfill his word. I want to do it just like he wants me to do it because you don't understand how special it is that I feel that Christ is in me. I look at it as the riches of the glory of of the mystery. Christ is in me, and that's why I have hope. And that's why I don't preach anybody. I don't preach any philosophy, but I preach him. And that's why I warn, and that's why I teach, but I do it with all wisdom. And I do it for a purpose, because I love the people that God has put in my life, because he put them in my life for purpose, on purpose, because I'm the one to be in their life. And I want them to be mature in Christ. I want to present them. I want to look at them that they are my responsibility, that I want to present them. That's what he feels here, right? That, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And this is not the job of preachers or pastors. This is the job of every believer, that we, not me, not I. He says, him, not I preach, but him we preach. He says that we, not I, may present every man. That we may present every man. And then, as I'm doing this, I'm going to put all my all into it. Not just shortchange things. I'm going to labor. I'm going to strive. I know it's hard, but I find myself so energized because he's working in me. And when he works in me, he works mightily. I really pray we just come before God. I, I wish we have time to spend in prayer and and to sing, but we took a little bit long. But let's just let's just meditate and think about what God has spoken and what's written in the Word. And if God has spoken to you about something, please just just ask Him for help. Maybe it's something that we need to confess. Maybe it's something we need to repent before God. Maybe it's, it's what we've been doing. It hasn't been fully from the heart, and we need to maybe start laboring and striving. Maybe it's an issue of we don't feel empowered. Then maybe we need to, to, to go before God and ask for his filling and his anointing. Maybe we need to go back to that first love of the excitement of realizing the riches of the glory that Christ dwells in us. Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us, and we are, what an amazing, what an amazing responsibility that you've given us. We are so unworthy, Father, yet you find, you see us differently. So we pray that we would live according to the calling by which we were called. I pray that we would preach the gospel, that we would share with the lost, but I also pray that we would preach, that we would, that we would serve the body, the church, to mature the believers, the, the, the new believers and, and the believers who have been believers for a while. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to realize how amazing it is, how rich it is, how glorious it is that you, O oh Jesus, dwell in us. And let that empower us. And let that hope of glory just resonate with us, to bring us back to our first love. That with that love, we may be able to preach you, O oh Jesus, and stop talking about ourselves. 
Stop talking about stuff that doesn't matter. But to preach you and to warn every person, let us have good and proper and appropriate relationships with each other that help each other grow. Help us teach each other as we learn and, and just share our learnings with each other. And help us do it from our heart, laboring and striving, being empowered by you, O Holy Spirit. Pray for fruit for these words. In Jesus' name we pray.